ever felt like you're inadequate to actually share something? Like you know it's there, but you think it's such a big deal, it's very difficult to get across. And that's the issue that we're going to be looking at. But here's what happened. So I wrote a whole message on forgiveness because we're in Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount, particularly the Lord's Prayer. And it says, forgive us our debts as we forget our debtors. And, and I'm going to do this whole thing on forgiveness, and I'm writing it, and I'm going, I just don't think that's, I don't think that's right. And, and it's basically can't be right because it's way too long, first of all. And one of the things... And one of the things I remember when I used to be one of you guys was the pastor sometimes would get to a spot and he'd go, oh, i got to rush through this. And I always thought, well, you're the one who decides when to stop. Why can't you just start up again next week? So we are sitting in now at least a two-week message on forgiveness. I think it's that big of a deal. And the reason I decided to do it this way is I think forgiveness is probably the most misunderstood concept within Christianity. Uh, I, I hear, in fact, it's funny because I, my, uh, Behringer, David Behringer and, uh, Dave Bauer, D squared, I'll, anytime I'm, I'm excited about something, poor Dave, you're just trying to make a living out there in the back of a tractor, right? And I'll send him these very deep theological open-ended questions that I'm really not asking Dave to, to give me the answer to. I just don't have anybody else in my house who, who really wants to talk to me, right? <laughs> so I'll... I'll just send him to Dave and poor Dave. Yeah, and you probably feel like it's a setup every time. Because I'll ask him a question, and then Dave will answer something, and I'll go, no, that's not it. <laughs> go, well, all right. Uh, and in fact, Dave, last week at one point, I don't know if this is an appropriate thing for a man of God to say, and in fact, I don't think with his kids here I should probably say it, but I want to, at a certain point, as I was having this conversation, uh, young Behringers, your, your father said to me, and I have it on, he says, stop being a butt. Didn't you? Yeah. yeah. Don't say it out loud in here. Yeah. Because people, uh, but I did say to you, I said, that helps me out a lot. Because what I think is that people misunderstand so much of it because what we hear people say are things like this, don't we? We hear people say, forgive and forget. Now, for those, <laughs> right. for those of you who've actually been deeply wounded, forgive and forget. Does that seem as if not here? Hold on. Does that seem as if that does have some spiritual value to it? Yes, some, but does it seem as if that's actually an accurate and complete statement, forgive and forget? No, no, I, but people say it all the time. And can you imagine if you think you're supposed to forgive and forget, that that's what Christians have taught you? Can you imagine the guilt you feel when you find out you just can't forget? That it's still something that, that you remember? It's bad. You think, well, I guess it's good for everybody else. They can seem to pull it off, but I certainly can. I hear people say this. I've heard people say things like this. If you forgive someone, then you have to live your life as if that didn't happen. That you just have to act, you don't, it's not about, you don't bring it up again, it's never talked about with them. You just love, keeps no record of wrongs. And I'm like, well, I get, I get what they're trying to say. Don't you get it? Right? You don't want to, if you've hurt somebody and, and you're back together and you've restored the relationship, you don't want it to continue to be brought up. I get what they're saying, but is forgiving someone acting like it didn't happen? No, not at all. I, I actually, though, quite often in counseling... I'm dealing with the offending party in a relationship. And the offending party wants to rush right back into the relationship. And they, they want us to believe that forgiveness always means reinstatement into a relationship. That forgiveness, if, well, if they forgive me, if you're a Christian, you forgive me, that must mean reinstatement. In fact, um, I've had one of the pushbacks I've had throughout the years when I talk about forgiveness, and this will be the longest time I've ever spoken about it. But I was thinking about it. Uh, I think forgiveness is the kingdom. I think forgiveness is the gospel. I think that many of the foundational truths that we've talked about, they are absolutely truth, but I think when we get to forgiveness, this, this is it. This is huge. This is bigger than we understand. And so I was talking to someone about this, and, and we were talking at, at depth about it, and one of the things he said to me, it's a pastor, he said this statement, he goes, I think forgiveness is the gospel. And I thought, well, I think that deserves at least one message to itself, and then two more later. The offending party, though, thinks it means a reinstatement, and I've been pushed back all the time because I'll say up front that if I do three weeks, the third week is going to be misunderstand, misperceptions uh, about forgiveness. And one of them is that forgiveness means reinstatement. Does forgiveness necessarily mean reinstatement? I've said this to people, and I get the biggest pushback of all time 
about this is on this. But I tell people, if I hire uh, Kira to babysit um, our child, which my child's older than you, so that wouldn't happen. But, but, but you know what I mean? If I were to hire Kira to babysit our, our child and I come home and my child has a red welt on their face because Kira lost her cool and slapped, I sh- you know what, I should have actually used Annabelle because she got a yellow card in soccer. That would probably be more accurate than <laughs> slapping a child. Um, but Kira, let's just say, who never would, uh, would slap my kid and she says she's sorry. Can I forgive her? Do I hire her next Friday? Absolutely not. That forgiveness does not mean reinstatement necessarily. It can. But I think the reason it's misunderstood is because people within the church, they don't actually understand the problem. They don't understand the actual problem. No, we understand the process. And this is what Dave and I were talking about. We, we even understand to some degree our responsibility. But we don't place forgiveness within the space it inhabits in the kingdom of God, the actual issue. And I know this because when I ask people about forgiveness, what they describe is not the problem, myself included. We describe the process. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote Dave this week. Yeah. Stop being a... No, that's a different... No. Um, he says, we forgive them. I forgive them because God forgives me. Is that true? Is that accurate? 100% accurate. But is that describing the problem or the process? It's the process. And we both were doing that. That's what I was... I was going, man, but it's got to be more, Right? It's got to be more than that because we're not describing the issue. We're just describing the process of forgiveness. I I hear people say, I have to give grace when people offend me as as a believer. Is that true? Yes, but again, is that describing the problem or the process? It's the process of forgiving someone. So we just skip over the real issue. And the weight of anything, and I've said this, uh, if you misdiagnose the issue then you will prescribe the wrong medication. Is that not true? If you don't understand the real problem, then you'll be chasing around these misdiagnoses for years. So what if I told you this? Let's, let's, I mean, I, Dave offended me deeply this week by calling me a very harsh name. So, so let me offend you guys. My mother asked me if I like offending you guys, and I, uh, this was a while ago. She goes, you like hurting people's feelings. And I said, I don't mind it. Um, but, but here we go. What if I told you that in your offense, that you being offended, the times you, you've been hurt, that while it's been painful, while it's been hurtful, and I, I, I can't tell you how deep it was, I don't know, but what if I told you that you being hurt while painful doesn't make you the offended party? I know, right? That you're not actually the offended party. King David, after he slept with Bathsheba and the, the actual thing, if you really want to know if that's the truth of the scripture, he's the king, right? He sees a young woman naked and bathing. He commands her to come to his room. He commands her to have sex with him. This isn't, we say, oh, he slept with her. He raped her, guys. This is, this is a rape. You guys, we don't know the violent context of it. I'm not trying to be, you know, uh, I'm not trying to be salacious. I, in fact, just the, it should drive us to understand the depth of this. But the power there, it's not, it's not an agreed-upon thing, necessarily. So he, he commands her, forces her into a sexual relationship with Bathsheba. King David, he gets her pregnant. And you guys know the story. If you don't, watch this. He has one of his, they call him David's men, David's mighty men, who would give their life for King David, who throughout his entire running from King Saul, David, the greatest hero in all of Israel's history, had a group of men who would do anything to defend him. You guys understand that? They were with him at everything, and one of them was a man named Uriah, who was actually married to who? Bathsheba. So David um, arranges to have, in the next battle, where they're fighting for David, they're fighting for God, they're fighting for Jerusalem, they're fighting for Israel, David says, put Uriah, this mighty man who would give his life for me, who defends everything, about me and about our God, put him at the front of the battle, and when it gets most heated, what does he command his generals to do? Pull back. Pull back. Killing Uriah. He, he, he sleeps with Bathsheba. He has, I, can I, I just, I gotta say it, he rapes Bathsheba. He gets her pregnant, and then when he can't trick Uriah into this thinking it's his baby, he murders this man of great loyalty to him, so he's later, he's confronted by Nathan. 
who says, I've seen what you did. I know what you did. And then the child gets sick. They lose the child. And David, in his mourning, after the baby died, he mourns this stuff. This is in Psalms. He mourns his failures. He repents before God, but in his mourning, he said something amazing. And I don't have it up here because I rewrote this. And Psalm 51.4, he said, against who? Against you only, God, have I sinned. Now, I've heard people throughout the years get very mad. They've used this to say that the, the God of Scripture is patriarchal and misogynistic, that he hates women, that he doesn't acknowledge the pain he does. They don't understand this. But i got to tell you, nothing about Scripture when you read this, nothing hints that David was downplaying the pain that he had caused. In fact, we know very well he understands exactly what he had done, Right? He understands what he had done. He wasn't denying the relational bomb that he had set off in the midst of this family. In fact, he mourns and he knows that this is going to impact Israel forever. Relationships, international, national, personal, they're all going to be torn apart because of his failure. But he knew, he knew in his time spent with God, in his repentance, that he had only, and I shouldn't say only, yeah, he said only, didn't he? ultimately only offended God. Now you ask how this might come about in the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord's Prayer. Well, Jesus actually says this and when he teaches the Lord's Prayer. You might miss this, but let's dive into it. We miss it because we fail to understand the weight of our offenses to one another. We rush to the process and we don't diagnose the problem. And so, as I asked at our home group a couple weeks ago, our life group, I asked them, I said, how were you taught the Lord's Prayer? And most of them, in fact, everybody in there said, I was just taught it. It was just kind of a thing to memorize. There's power in, rest, in memorizing Scripture, and it was presented to us as a powerful thing. But the problem of forgiveness, what is actually occurring here? Well, it was never really addressed. And if we do that, if we don't fail, if we do fail to understand the true weight of our offenses, and so here was what you think about it. Don't think about the things that have been done to you as much until a little bit later. Right now, think about the things you have done to people relationally. Think about the offenses you have delivered. Because if you fail to understand the problem, the true weight of what we have done to each other is missed. And then the true power of forgiveness is missed. And so let's look at what we've already covered in the Sermon on the Mount where he's talking about the Lord's Prayer. Matthew 6, 9 to 11. And I will say again, if any of these are messed up, it isn't because Barry uh, messed up. This was on me. This is what, and, and say with me, and we're going to skip. So recite the Lord's Prayer with me. Pray then in this way. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And we've covered all of these things because each of these statements, leave that up for a minute. Each of these statements contain a, a, a foundational truth about a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. When you read the Lord's Prayer, it's contained within the Sermon on the Mount. And when you read the Sermon on the Mount, please do. For those of you who for years now have been taught, I'm upset the Ten Commandments were taken out of the schools. Well, I understand what you're conveying, but the truth of it is... The Sermon on the Mount describes what a citizen of the kingdom of heaven should look like in their daily life. This is us. And in that, he says these foundational truths. He says, approach him as your father. He says, hallow him, revere him, seek to understand his true nature. And in that causes reverence. And then he says, your will be done. His will for us is the first and foremost to be transformed in the image of who? Christ, this transformational process, let it occur where? On earth it is in heaven. Start with me in such a way that in my life, that the things that you speak in heaven, the things you desire are done like that. That's how quickly I respond. And then from within me, stretch the kingdom out. And this total dependence upon everything, our daily bread. And we talked about that last week. And sadly, um, Barry couldn't be here. And it, it was pretty good. Right? I always seem to do that. People go, that was the best ever. And I'm like, ah, no video, no proof that I, I'm all right. I'm not a butt. <laughs> what begs the, oh, yeah. So he says this, but then he says this. He begins to say this, and each of these statements describe a foundational truth. Each of these are characteristics that I would say that if they are not evident in your life, you should go back and ask yourself why. In fact, I would say better, go back and ask the Holy Spirit, why do I not look like these? Why are these not evident in my life? 
But then he says this, Matthew 6, 12. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Now, how many of you, when you read that just then, you, you automatically, now that's kind of awkward because I've heard it some, I've read, heard it written different. Raise your hand if you memorized it differently than that, right? Trespasses. Who's heard trespasses? Oh, okay. More hands went up the second time, I, right? Who's heard transgressions? Anybody heard transgressions? Okay. So the truth of it is, though, that we were taught this, but actually, I want to say this before we move on. Forgiveness is foundational to our faith. Would you agree with that? Forgiveness is foundational. So much so that it's the only statement that Jesus expands upon. It's the only one he actually expands upon. Look what he says, 6, 14, and 15. He says, for if you forgive others of their transgressions, okay? If you forgive others of their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will what? Boy, that should get our attention, shouldn't it? I mean, we shouldn't just pass by that and think, well, I know the Lord's Prayer. And then of all the stuff that Jesus taught, when it comes to forgiveness, he goes, we've got to sit here for a minute, right? These transgressions, these transpass, trespasses. But the word used in this Lord's Prayer, actually, it says to whom someone is owed. It means debts. That Jesus in the Lord's Prayer says, forgive us our debts as we forgive those who owe us a debt. This is huge, and that's what got me thinking. That's what I kept bothering D squared with, my two guys. I'm like, man, this has got to be something. In fact, I, almost everybody I met who is associated with the church, um, I've asked this week, man, what, what did they steal? Debt. What, what? Because there's only two ways someone can have a debt, can incur a debt. One is I've loaned them something. Well, I certainly didn't loan these people who've hurt me anything. So the other way for them to owe something is to steal something, is it not? That which is owed. Because therein lies the actual problem. Because when we sin against someone, this is huge, we have stolen something from them. Now, I want you to think about the times you've been hurt. I want you to think about the relationships that have been damaged. I would ask you guys, is there not something in your soul that says that statement is 100% true? That when people hurt you, did you not feel they stole something from you? The problem. They stole something. Now, I also want you to know that while you may be the hero of your story and someone else's, you are the villain. And you have stolen something from someone else. We've taken things from them, which begs then the question. If we've created this debt-debtor relationships, we've got to ask ourselves, what? Well, what is it? What is it that's taken from us when someone sins against us? And then I think a better question, what do we steal from others when we do the same? Because Jesus did not say in his Sermon on the Mount, in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus did not say, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Isn't that interesting? He says, forgive us our debts that we owe you. Forgive us the debt that I owe you, God, as I forgive others the debt they owe us. Jesus frames it in this financial, this legal term. Paul, in all of the scripture, he couches it in legal terms all the time, doesn't he, John? He says, debt paid on a tree. This idea of canceling a debt. And then Jesus, he ties in the Lord's Prayer. He ties what we steal from people to what we've stolen from who? He goes, man, as, as you forgive us what we owe you, I, I'm going to forgive others what they owe us because as always, and I say this, and, and, and I say the same stuff all the time because I find it helpful to me, and if it's helpful to me, I assume it's going to be helpful to you guys. As always, the struggles we face today, they find their origin in the garden, do they not? The, the, this, the echoes of the garden are always present in the struggles of today. So let's consider our first parents. They were created by God. They were blessed by God. They spent time fellowshipping with God. So far, so good? Am I right? They were made in His image. Is that not true? They were made in His image, and they were given a vocation. You see, this idea of our purpose, where we would find our purpose, our identity, 
our happiness, all the scrambling you guys find, I continue to say, because I believe it's scriptural, that the whole idea is for us to resume our vocation, to pick up our vocation that our first parents, they were given, made in God's image, and that means what? That they were to present to the world, as I've said many times, like angled mirrors, N.T. Wright calls it, like angled mirrors, they were to give the world God's heart, his thoughts. His emotions those thoughts create, the behaviors those emotions give birth to should represent God. This is what it means to give the world his heart. We have been given his image, and then you were supposed to give what back to God? What is rightfully God's? Our worship. I want you to think about that. What is, in, in, it, what is intrinsically tied to God, that we owe him, that is rightfully his, that it is his very nature. Does he not deserve, is he not, is he not the only thing truly worthy of our worship? You say that quietly. If we're going to be anything, we are going to know this as a church. Who is the only individual, created, uncreated, the only thing in this world worthy of our worship? And to say it's because he did something is partially true. But it's because of what? Who he is. And our first parents, what did they do? They chose to look to created things, to give to created things, what was rightfully whose? God. They began to look to these things that only God should be given. And they began to give them. They began to give what? our praise, our worship to things. They chose to look to created things for their meaning, for their purpose. We do it today. For those of you who need your husband, need your wife, even in a great relationship, to validate your purpose, your identity, make no mistake about it. That is an echo from the garden, is it not? It's a great thing. For those of you who need your kids to love, you need for them to respect, you need... Make no mistake about it, you are worshiping your children. For those of you who need something outside of God for your validation, your vocation, your calling, and your purpose, you are worshiping idols. Is that not true? I've made nothing up so far, and I hope I don't as I continue. But by worshiping things, our first parents, they not only denied God what was rightfully his with praise and worship, they did so by denying his value, his worth. See, you, you can't turn away from God without saying, eh, I don't really think you are who you say you are. You can't turn away from God and say, ah, you know, you have to say, I, I just think that it's overblown my need for you. It's overblown your presence in my life. They abandoned their vocation. They gave to things what was rightfully owed to God, their worship. They denied his value, and do you know what that created? It created a debt that we owe God that we could never repay. Make sense? There's a debt because of what we have rejected. They disregarded the very value of God, therefore choosing to live without the benefits of a relationship with God. Um, you guys understand when you create a debt, that debtor can call it at any time, right? When someone, when you owe somebody something at any point, you have said, I've given all the power to you in this relationship. You can call in this debt whenever you want. You've actually, in fact, I would say, you've walked outside as they did. This, this, this relational benefit now has become skewed, and they've rejected the benefits of God when they rejected the relationship, the value of the relationship. And the value of the relationship with God, I have to tell you, is not based upon what I bring to it. The value of a relationship with God is based upon the value of God. So our first parents, they rejected it. They denied him what was rightfully his, and they stole from him. Do you understand that? Gary, do you get that? They stole from God what is rightfully his. They stole, and I would say, and we're going to talk about this a little more next week. They also stole the relationship they were designed for, didn't they? That God designed us for his pleasure, for relationship. We'll talk a little bit about that. But that will be the power we talk about next week. They not only stole what was rightfully his, the worship, the praise, but they stole. And for those of you who go, man, I don't get that. Really? Parents, dad's in here. 
You've never felt as if some power in this world is stealing something that your child, when your child starts to pursue it. You ever felt that? Anybody ever felt like a relationship was stolen from you? Well, so did God. So Jesus, God in flesh, arrives upon the earth and he delivers an invitation. He said, please, don't read this, the, the Sermon on the Mount. Do not read the Lord's Prayer as something simply to memorize, although I, I probably don't say this enough. I believe in the power of memorizing Scripture. But I would say don't only see it that way. He delivers an invitation to share in the same intimate relationship with God that he has. The most powerful thing I've said in the, last, in the four years that we've been doing this is our Father. When he says to people, you can go to God as he's your father. You're his child. This entire relationship. First thing he says is, here's an invitation to become a child of God, which begs a question. I'm going to offend some of you, but here we go. Wait, though. Isn't everyone a child of God? No. Wow, you were pretty sure on that. I have, just, I'll get there. <laughs> but you know, people always tell me that, though, right? In this world, if you're not cautious, you will begin to believe stuff that everybody says that isn't scriptural. That everyone is a child of God. Everyone is a child of God. Well, wait a minute. Didn't Jesus say that only those who do my Father's will are my brothers and sisters? Jesus said plainly, not everyone is a child of God. Only those who accept his offer become God's children. And what was his offer? To pay the debt. To pay the debt you owe because he's the only one who could. Now, now here's what's important to hear today. While not everyone, this is big for forgiveness. This is the whole point of today. Not, not everyone, while not everybody is a child of God, everyone is an image bearer of God. That's huge. You see, this is something we don't understand that we don't operate every day as if we are coming across the likeness of God in every individual we see. That imbued in everyone is the true value that he placed upon them. So I'll say it again. While not everybody is a child of God, everyone is an image bearer of God. This is so insanely cool. God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have been in this cosmic dance of relationship. Outside of time eternal, don't ask me how to explain it, I don't get it, right? But outside of time eternal, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have been in this beautiful, cosmic, eternal, supernatural dance of relationship. And so he created us in his image. And here's what you need to understand. When you begin to think, oh, someone stole something from me, of course they did. Do you not realize that God, by his very nature, is relational? God's nature is relational. So when I say all the time, and I've said it for the 30 years I've been doing ministry, every person who ever sat through a youth group for an extended period of time would tell you, I, they would answer, we are all created for relationships. God's nature is relational, and we bear his image he created for all of us to be in this relationship. We, we're relationally, supernaturally, spiritually, we are relational. And then he in, imbued us, though, also in his image, everybody with value, with worth, as image bearers. He put his stamp of value, his worth, like any government would. A coin is only worth what the government that issues it says, is it not? The one who created us said it is infinitely worth, worth, valuable. It is infinitely valuable because it bears my image. I'm the one behind it. I am the one upholding the currency of people. Everyone you see, everyone you see is an image bearer of God. Everyone is imbued by God-given value and worth. And since we were designed by an intrinsically relational God, Four relationships, and this is huge. I'm building a case that we're going to next week. We're just talking about the problem today. Everyone is imbued with God-given value and worth, and since we were designed by an intrinsically 
relational God for relationships, guess where that value or worth is fully expressed? Relationally. Get it? That the way that we treat each other is where our value, that this worth is fully expressed. We were designed for relationships. So what I see when I talk to you, what you give back to me, this is where that value on this earth is fully expressed, meaning that you will never, I've said this in the past, but I'll say it again in this context, you will never, and, and please understand this, because on the other side of it is great blessings, right? Great blessings. It means you will never have an encounter with someone that God is not personally interested in. You will never, never, I, I chose the Greek word. You know what the Greek word means? Never <laughs> have an encounter with someone that God is not personally interested in. Every single, your life consists of spiritual transactions every day. Every day, there's these spiritual transactions. Um, your marriage, your wife, your husband, your children, sure. But every single image bearer you come across, God is personally interested because it is his value that you either affirm or deny. Our actions, our words, our attitudes, they either affirm the image they bear, their God-given value, that of a fundamentally relational God, or we deny their worth, and we damage their relationship. And when we do that, we steal from them. Isn't that crazy? Are you guys quiet because I'm totally wrong? Or are you quiet because it's hitting you? Yeah, a lot of faces. I, I, I won't say their name um, because it would be to, you know, I don't, I don't like to um, secrets and stuff that people share with me. But when I shared this with Dave Berenger, oops, um, <laughs> right, you said, well, I guess I need to be nicer to who? My wife, My wife he said. And I was like, I, I texted back, I said, well, I mean, everybody, right? Didn't I say that? And Dave goes, yeah, but I feel like I probably need to start with my wife. And I thought, no, that's actually very spiritual. That's very deeply spiritual. Start with those in your home. Realize that when you offend them, you're not just hurting them. Don't tell yourself, oh, I, I deserve. They, no, you have stolen from them. You've offended who? God, because it's his value, his worth. The relational nature that you've damaged was placed in them by an intrinsically relational God. It reflects his desire for a relationship. So start with your wife, your husband, your children, your spouse. Start, but also realize you will never have an interaction with anybody. Coaches, don't kid yourself when you're doing this thing that, oh, competitive spirit. God doesn't give a dang. But he might give a damn when you mistreat it. You guys get it? If you don't treat people the way I've treated you, well, you won't get the way I want to treat you. We'll talk about that in a minute. A fundamentally relational God made us all fundamentally relational. And he stamped us, every one of us, every one of us. The homeless situation in this town is horrible. And I see people, I was going to Cor Corvallis uh, yesterday. We're coming back from McMinnville. Spencer uh, bought a car. Do you guys see it out there? Pretty cool. It's way too loud and it made my stomach hurt. Um, but I'm coming back uh, through Corvallis, and I saw a man, obviously a homeless man of some kind, and he's got his sh no shirt on, he's got a, a blanket over here, and as I drove by, he's peeing on the street. And I thought to myself, usually I would have thought, but I, hey, homeless problem, taxes, all this stuff. And you know what? I, yeah, yes. But here's what I thought. That is a, that is a person who bears God's image who absolutely has been imbued with, and I, I began to think, what happened relationally to this guy? What was stolen from him over the years that, that shouldn't have been? And how does God's heart break over people who every one of those instances that people dealt with that man, God was personally interested in, was personally interested in, and it didn't happen. They didn't affirm it. They didn't tell him his value, but instead they stole, and they stole, and they stole to the point that that person is so valueless in our society. 
Because when we steal enough value from people, they become worthless. Man, I, I just couldn't think a whole way home. Go, this is crazy. I think about things like this. Um, I think about things like this. We, we have Caden, who, who has his own stuff. He's awesome, but he's got his own stuff. And he doesn't navigate life all the time uh, on his own very accurately. And it has hit me a couple times in life really hard. I can't imagine if Caden would have been born into another home. Right? It tears me up to think about what would happen to him if he wasn't born into a loving home that affirmed his value and a group of people like this who affirm his value. We see them all the time, and I just think, God, this is crazy. The value people have, if we don't give them the value they have, we treat them as worthless. Is that not how you have felt in your own relationships when people stole from you? Worthless, creating this debt. I've done it to people, creating a debt owed to them by me. But it echoes the debt we owe God as we have given to things what is owed to God. Make no mistake about it. Your idolatry over cash, over finances, over houses, over buildings, over vanity, over pretty, over abs, over cars, over things that God said, enjoy. I've given them you to enjoy. But your idolatry of those things, when you make good things, God things, you miss the greatest gift of all, which is the relationship with God. And Jesus said as much. He said it in the Lord's Prayer. He said, we owe God this debt because we have stolen from him. He says, forgive us our, as we forgive our debtors. Forgive those of us to whom a debt is owed. A debt that God has forgiven those who become not just his children. He forgives the debt. And we don't just become his children, but we become citizens of the kingdom of God, where forgiveness is is the foundation. Have I made that point? It's non-negotiable. My friend, Matt Coleman at Hillside, as we're talking, he said, I think forgiveness is the gospel, and it stuck with me. I can't say it's not. I, I think he's more right than I am. This kingdom, which Jesus said, arrived, commenced with his arrival upon the earth. And I'm going to say next week, as we look around the world, does it look as if his kingdom is present? We're going to talk about it next week because it is absolutely here. Jesus said the citizens of the kingdom of God understand the great debt which we have incurred against God. And here's what he says. All that to say this. This is so big. And you get to decide. You. See, don't do this thing. I, 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 the thing I, can I say hate? I think so in this regard. One of the problems, yeah. I hate when people blame God for his righteousness. I hate when people blame God for their choices to step outside of the relationship. I hate when people say, well, a God I know would never send it. He, me too. The God that I know now is my father. Jesus said, I did not come to condemn. I came to. Look at this. You get to decide how God treats the debt you owe him by your participation in the kingdom of God. You get to decide how God deals with your debt owed to him by your choice to forgive or your refusal. And it's going to be, please come back next week because this is misunderstood. For time constraints, I cannot tell you all the stuff that I know in your head is coming through. Well, what about, no, I'm not denying your hurt, and I'm certainly not saying it's reinstatement. I'm not saying that it's all of those things. I'm just saying, let's focus on the problem today, all right? The problem is these debts that are owed, and when you refuse, God says, fine. If you don't want forgiveness to be a part of your life, I won't force it on you. Isn't that crazy? So we're going to continue to discuss forgiveness next Sunday because we've only discussed the problem. Causing a debt between us, causing a debt we owe God, but we haven't even begun to, to consider the power of canceling a debt, have we? Because the process, we understand the responsibility. But I want you guys to leave today feeling the weight of what we stole from people. 
what you steal from your child, what you steal from your coworkers, what you steal from people. And I want you to understand that God is intensely, intensely, personally interested because the one you're offending, is, it's hurting them, but the truly offended party is who? Because you're denying his value that he's placed upon someone. Echoes of the garden. But let me preface next week with this because I do want to have a little bit of a toe in the water. Forgiveness, I believe, is the oxygen of the kingdom of God. It's the oxygen. You see, when someone hurts us, when someone offends us, when someone steals something from us, when someone creates this burden that I feel, it's deep, man, and I'm holding on to it. I'm holding on to it. And we all know, and we'll talk about it next week, the power, but you don't know all the power. We focus only on the power that it's going to give me, but let's focus on that for a second. Next week, we'll talk. There is more power than we imagine. But we're holding on to this. It's like holding our breath. Do you realize that the stuff that you have, that you're holding in, is toxic? It's, it's killing you. If you were to hold your breath, that stuff has no power. So this idea of forgiveness, the oxygen of the kingdom, is to just release it so that you can do what? Inhale life. Inhale the blessings that come from this, which we will talk about. That we're going to talk about, we can inhale the blessings of relationship. We can inhale this, this debt that's been forgiven us, but also then we can begin to move within the oxygen of the kingdom where forgiveness becomes this thing. But in order to accept what God has promised, we must exhale this hatred. We have to exhale the hurt, people. We have to let it go. And I'm not saying it's not difficult. I am saying I know how hard it is. Been there, done that. Some of you guys have been holding your breath for far too long. Some of you guys are living in it. But to exhale it is the only way we can breathe in all this life-giving power that God promises us. God promises us that life-giving power will come with this decision. Misunderstood. I'll hit on that already. Do you guys realize forgiveness is not a feeling? It's an act of will that is assisted immediately by the Holy Spirit. And I am not telling you what's going to come back to you. I'm saying the first thing is you have to choose to do it. And what's going to come back to you is crazy because there is more power than we realize that is promised to us when we decide to finally exhale the hurt. The kingdom of God is not just available to us, but the kingdom of God is expanded. In fact, I'll say this. Oh, next week. This is what I'm going to tell you next week. When you choose to forgive someone, you are defeating the very bonds of evil that this world has. Because you have said, when you choose to forgive someone, and I'll say it again next week, when you choose to forgive someone, you are saying hatred and evil will not have the last word. But the last word that will be spoken in everything I do, in every relationship I have, the last word spoken will be love. In a political season where we're all talking about whose voice we want heard and the powers of man, which we'll talk about, please think about it, it's important. But in a political season, I think much more important in every season of your life is deciding what voice will be heard last in your life. For me, it's going to be love. And we'll talk about the power of that when it comes to the kingdom. I realize some of you have been great, greatly wounded and that this stuff, you're thinking, man, I'm going to let them off the hook. I, I don't know. I had a gentleman one time come up to me and after I talked about anger years ago, 25 years ago, up at the chapel. And he came up to me, and he's in tears, and he's a big man. I said, what's going on? I said, he goes, man, he goes, I don't know what to say, because if I'm not angry, I don't know who I am. And I thought, man, isn't that the truth? Isn't that the truth? You have to exhale. And I realized, for some of us, our identity has been based upon what is done to us. And I'm here to tell us, as believers, our identity should be found in what has been done for us. So I'm going to pray for you guys. Say hello to each other. There's a lot of you out there. Don't just rush out. We're a pretty cool group, right? Except for Behringer. Let's pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, thank you, so much. thank you so much for everything you've given me, including my dearest and oldest friends. 
thank you for relationships that are, that are captured in, in text throughout a week where I think of someone and I send it and, and you supernaturally impose, man, relationship right in the middle of this stuff. Thank you for every good gift. For those things that have been stolen from us, if we would ask those right now who feel that, I would ask, I would ask that you would you would begin to work this process of exhaling hurt, exhaling hurt so they could inhale the great gifts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.